If you're interested in overcoming the fears that stop you creating the business of your dreams, then listen in. Plus, I stick my neck out and share four of the best camel jokes you've probably never heard. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day, motivated business owner. It is Timbo Reid back here again, and well done to you for joining us inside the movement that we lovingly refer to as Small Business Big Marketing, a movement, by the way, Laser focused on helping you grow an amazing business through some very, very smart marketing. And to that end, I reckon we get stuck right in to some marketing G O L D. Small business, big marketing with Tim Reid. Now, I was at the gym this morning with my mate Ben. Two smelly blokes working up a sweat. It was not pretty, let me tell you. A bit of treadmill action, a few floor exercises, and then the hard part, the weight room. Now, one thing I find with lifting weights is that I need to be angry, or at least very motivated, to lift something unusually heavy. Not time for joking around, and it's certainly not a time for this. That wonderful track by Birdie has a time and a place, and it's not when you're about to bench press a small cow. I'd prefer something like this. I do love a bit of Akadaka. Now, this is not the first time I've come across businesses getting the little things wrong. I see travel agents with empty brochure stands, restaurant staff that don't give you a simple acknowledgement when you walk in, and tradies that don't take their shoes off as they enter your home. These are the little things we do in business that we just aren't mindful of. But our customers are, team. So stop right now and ask yourself, or your customers even better, what little things are you doing or not doing that really, really piss them off? And then fix them now, not tomorrow, not next week, now. You would have heard me talk about one percenters before, those little amazing moments that get talked about. This is not them. What I'm referring to here are just those little simple things that you should be doing in your business. Those non-negotiables, tickets to the game, if you will. Get them wrong, and as Paul Kelly once sang, from little things, big things grow. Enough from me. Go get them sorted. Now. From little things, big things grow. From little things, big things grow. All right, plenty of gold in today's show, as promised. Shortly, I'll be chatting with Camelia. Yes, Camelia, Russell Osborne of Outback Australian Camels about chasing down your dreams. It's a very, very interesting interview. Plus, President Obama drops by to share some listener feedback. But first, let me tell you about how our good friends at Net Registry can help you crank out some great marketing online. You know how the online marketing world is full of acronyms, SEO, PPC, DNS, SEM. Seriously, as a small business owner, my advice is not to worry about those acronyms, but do worry about marketing your business online. You see, from what I've observed, motivated small business owners are running Google AdWords campaigns, are optimizing their site for the search engines, do have secure web hosting, and they do have great website design. Motivated small business owners are also not doing all this themselves. And that's where the good folk at Net Registry step in. Net Registry exist to get your online marketing sorted, team. It's what they do. If you're not marketing your business online, then you're leaving money on the table. I promise you, you are leaving money on the table. Check them out, netregistry.com.au. Tell them Timbo sent you. Let's get stuck in to today's guest, and it is a very, very interesting interview. Now, I was put on to Russell Osborne by another listener, Brett Perry. Brett Perry's a fellow podcaster, by the way. He's out of Chicago. He has a show called Down Under and Beyond. And he sent me a note a few weeks ago saying, just a short note from Chile, Chicago, with a suggestion, Timbo, for a future interview. Have a squiz at australiancamels.com. 
And he goes on to say, just great Aussies taking action on their business dreams and serving people at the same time. So I said, oh yeah, that kind of sounds interesting, but I wanted to know what the angle for my show was. So I emailed Brett back and Brett came back and he said, well, mate, you know what popped into my head when I was interviewing him and Brett interviewed him on his show was your chat with David Warren of Sydney Tall Ships. Boy, that was a past episode that got lots of sharing and commenting. Really good episode. Now, I don't reckon Russell was ever doing it as tough as David did, but the similarities lie in the way they both took a challenge. In Russell's case, it was severe depression after the death of his mum, and he used it to inspire a new direction and eventually a new business. So I got thinking, that starts to get interesting, and I did uh, approach Russell, he agreed to the interview, and we take this interview in all different directions. But at the end of the day, It is about finding your passion, overcoming your fear, and creating a business you love. Oh, and by the way, I apologize right now for the camel jokes. I couldn't resist. Russell Osborne, Camelier from Outback Australian Camels. Welcome to Small Business Big Marketing. G'day, Tim. How are you going? And g'day to all your listeners. Russ, uh, I want to start with the serious stuff. I want to go one for one on, with you on camel jokes. I've got a couple. What do you call a camel with no humps? Humphrey. Well, a horse. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, by, by the way, my, my listeners accuse me of, of too many dad jokes. So, uh, listeners, bad luck. I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, if, if a horse wears shoes, what do camels wear? <laughs> Slippers? Desert boots. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I'm on fire. I've got a couple more, but I'll just, I'm going to keep my powder dry. Because, yep. you know, we just, you know, it might be an interesting way to just kind of drop them in throughout the interview. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> that'll give you that'll give you time to remember some. Don't you hate it when someone says, tell us a joke, and you've got like, oh. Uh, uh, which one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you put me on the spot. <laughs> hey, Russ, um, on, on a more serious note, now, uh, you overcame depression. Well, you didn't overcome depression. Depression overcame you uh, mm. upon the passing of your mother. Can you yeah. tell us about that time and how it changed your outlook on business? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, well, I was actually working as a lecturer of English on the Gold Coast at that time. And yeah, my mother passed away and under fairly tragic sort of circumstances. Um, Mum was everything to me. We had a fantastic relationship. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it was just one of those moments in your life that you can't believe has happened, but of course it did. And um, when I finally made the decision actually to do something, um, I, I didn't actually have business in mind, to be honest. It was purely I wanted to do something for a charity because mum was heavily involved in charity. Um, and that was to walk across the country um, with a bunch of camels um, as my you know, vehicle um, for a children's charity. And, of course, I chose Maura Kelly's Children First Foundation for that so it was actually that decision I think you know full well when you've made that decision like it's almost like a wave comes over you and you realize that there is no turning back you realize that what you've done in the past has led you to that decision and that you've made the decision and more to the point and I explain this in my book camel man dreaming um that that decision you cannot go through life and not complete what it is that you've decided to do um, because you don't want to get to your deathbed and think, gee, I only wish I had have done that or I wonder what that would have been like if only I had the guts and the courage to follow through with that decision. Mm. That decision came about for you, like upon your mother's passing. Like, what what was the time period between your university lecturer? Yeah. Then you've gone, okay, this is not for me anymore. I'm going to do something different. What what time frame are we talking about before you made that decision? Uh okay. Well, well I was still actually lecturing when um, when Mum passed away, and mm. I went into depression. It was um, a very dark period of time, if you like. Or I didn't leave the house um, at all. 
uh, had all the curtains drawn and I was, you know, it was definitely the signs of, you know, a mental health issue there of, of depression. I mean, one in five of us are going to suffer from a mental health next year, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This year. You know? and, and, and on and on. And depression's a part of that. Um, so, um, yeah, recognizing that uh, I had that uh, depression, etc. When that decision was made, it was all lifted. Um, I had purpose again. I had a drive and a, a goal again. How how long, Russ, before yeah, that decision? Uh, I was still lecturing. That was the thing. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and um, and um, the part of the process, I suppose. I mean, I knew the why I was doing it, why, why I was going to change my life, hmm. but the how. Um, to be honest, wasn't actually important because the why was strong enough for the how to follow through. And was what? What? what explain you? Tell us your why. Okay. Well, the why was uh, I was going to honour mum to start with, and I was going to make sure that I did something significant in the world um, that had lasting results. And um, of course, lasting results in my books is if you save one life, you actually save the world entire. Um, it's an old Yiddish saying, apparently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my goal was to raise enough funds to be able to help charity save a life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my why, um, were, were those couple of reasons. And, and you, had, you, you found the, um, whilst, whilst on the, on the Yiddish uh, vocabulary, you found the chutzpah to, uh, to do that whilst, you know, curtains were closed and you're in a pretty dark place. Yeah. Yeah, mm. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, good on you, mate. And and uh, so, Russ, I want to just explore the idea of chasing your dream a bit more because I know I have listeners to this show who are either owning a business that they're no longer enjoying or they're trapped in the cubicle working for the man and yeah. they're just not doing what they love. What do yeah. you? What stops people from chasing down their dream? Do you think? Fear. Mm, heard that Stra before. Yeah. No. Straight out fear. Um, look, honestly, Tim, uh, look, I, I've been told and I was actually a part of it, you know, of telling people in education, you know, the, the, the way to do life is, you know, you, you go to school, get your good marks, you go to university, you, uh, you know, get a good degree, off you go into the workforce, you build up your career, you climb the corporate ladder, etc., yeah. and then you retire. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the meantime, you know, you might have ideas and, uh, you know, you want to do this and you want to do that, but you're feeling trapped within a pathway. Yep. Well, what's, what's wrong with actually stepping away from that pathway and designing your own life for yourself? And there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, you know, that is living your life, life worthwhile because you're, it's your life, you're living it. Mm. And you're fulfilling your dreams and goals in the meantime. Yes, it's not easy. Um, Tim, you know, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, anything's smooth sailing. Mm. Um, but basically, it's just a whole series of challenges along the way that you think up yourself. No one's presenting these challenges to you. You actually present these challenges to yourself and you overcome them. And in the meantime, you become a stronger person. And at the same time, you know, if it so happens to be in business, then your, um, you know, your money will flow. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. And I know that fear stops so – fear is the great stopper, isn't it? Whether you're looking at this – is, this is a marketing show. There's people thinking about even at a most basic level, uh, you know, fear of embarking on a new marketing strategy, fear of dropping an existing marketing strategy, but also fear of starting a new business, you know. it's just Exactly. And uh, to be uh, to be quite honest, again, you know, like I'm mean, designing the uh, walk across Australia there, I mean, two years of walking. Hmm. Um, just just a lazy, I, just a lazy couple of years, Russ. That's right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, it was the preparation. Um, you know, I did thirteen years preparation for that. Wow! And uh, because I knew nothing about the desert, I knew nothing about camels, etc. And I realised also after a number of years, when I was still lecturing, um, that it was me that had to change. 
I mean, for example, I mean, I was looking around, looking at, you know, different camel farms, etc., and seeing camels and um, uh, being in awe and wonder of how to go about this, you know, who do I follow? And I saw, of course, you know, I've got a hold of Robin Davidson's book and I've got a hold of, you know, any other blogs or journals or anything like that that I could of people who were doing that sort of thing. What? Walking and I was with getting, walk, do, doing what? Walking oh, with camels walking for a couple of years? Australia, yeah. Right. Yeah, cameleering, yeah. Right. And um, and so it was a matter of um, getting information and then also making yet another decision that I needed to change. Mm -hmm. It had to be me. And so I positioned myself to go into the desert and use my education degree um, to teach in the desert to be close to camels. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was actually the beginning point because... Uh, that's where I got my first camel was on a community called Warakuna, which is about 100 kilometres west of the Western Australian Northern Territory right. border. Well, one of these things, Russ, and this is the, this will be, everyone will be asking this right now, is like how did you cash flow it? Because you continued, you, you, you were suffering from depression, you continued yeah. to lecture, you'd go yeah. home, you'd shut the curtains, yeah. um, but you did you just slide in 13 years i mean that's a long time you could you could have got a camel on the moon by then mate but um <laughs> did, where, where was it? well i know that uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh camel expeditions that start and they fail very quickly right and i don't they, they, they hit a couple of humps do they that, that's about it yeah that's right exactly mm. um and i didn't want to be one of those people i had to know everything about the camel industry, about camels, camel handling, you know, mustering, etc., mm. um, and especially about tracking, you know, what's good, uh, how to make it enjoyable so that it was actually a, a beautiful journey, and it was. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's what actually took the 13 years. I had to become, I suppose, professional mm -hmm. um, would be the best word to use there, and uh, I could have done it a lot faster. You I know, that, on that. that on that fear thing, Russ, I've heard other. Or I've heard an entrepreneur recently say many avoid the road that leads to success just to avoid uh, risk yeah. or to avoid failure. Do you have you found that you know you've got kids, I've got kids. Um, you know, if you say to someone, um, you know, say to a kid, don't drop that, then they'll yeah. drop it. You yeah. know, like it's just human nature. So sure. have you found that in your experience then of, of kind of living your dream, your passion, chasing down something that really for you was life-changing that you just needed to focus on the positive the whole time? Yeah, sometimes the negative actually really helped as well though. Okay, how? Yeah, um, I mean the negativity of being in, in that period of depression, right, it didn't last all that long. Because uh, once a decision was made, I had focus and purpose. Uh -huh. um, but um, yeah, th there's there's a period that you know a lot of people would look at it as a very negative thing, and you know, oh, you know, uh, it's a doom and gloom, etc. But re reflecting upon it, it was actually a really positive um, period in in retrospect, in that um, a decision was made. Um, that I had thought about life and I'd thought about what mum did and I thought about where I was at and I had actually made a decision, it came about through that process uh, yeah. during that dark period to make changes in my life. How important are decisions? You know, oh, I, I just hugely. And, and, you know, there'd be some people going, yeah, well, you've got to make the right decision personally. You know, if if I get up in the morning and think, oh, shit, here we go again, which sometimes I do in terms of like, you know, every, busy, there's lots of stuff to do. You yeah. think, really, I might just take a day off. I yeah. find in making a decision, decide to do something, yeah. just builds the momentum. I've spoken about this before where it just, to me, it's yeah. the big machine that you've just got to crank up. And if you get a little bit of momentum by deciding to do one thing, then yep. once that's done, you can do the next. Are you kind of in that same space? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, look, um, part of what uh, kept the 13 years rolling was, uh, and of course I had to work and earn money, right, mm. in something. And uh, so, you know, it was either teaching or then eventually it became tour guiding. And uh, and when I was tour guiding out there in Kakadu, um, I'd be walking into Jim Jim Falls imagining every time I walked in there, imagining that there were eight camels behind me and I was walking down the main street of Melbourne. <laughs> so I had the final destination, if you yeah, like, of yeah. the actual journey in front of my face the entire time. 
and it couldn't get out of my head. And every single day, even when I was touring, I'd be writing a letter or I'd be, you know, putting stuff into my journal, which I knew that I was going to be putting into a book eventually. Uh, every single day, I'd do something. It, you know, it just and as you said, it built up the momentum until eventually the goal was achieved. Love it, mate. I love it. You've gone and uh, it might have taken 13 years, um, but you've, you've done it. Yeah, that's it, Tim. And I mean, I can get onto my deathbed and say, well, I know what that felt like. Yep. Yep. What do you call a really good camel joke, Russ? <laughs> a hump dinger. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be people pushing stop left right and center now uh but that's all right there's one more to come um so russ i'm, I'm loving this story so far mate you've, you've done the track you've raised a whole lot of money for charity you've got the book out of it it's now time to go well clearly you must have come back from that that track across australia two years with camels in tow yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. a, there's a joke there in itself but i'm not even going there <laughs> <laughs> so, so Russ, um, it's then time to start a business. So you must have come back with a business idea. Yeah, well, along the way, I mean, one of the beautiful things that we're finding out there taking people out with the camels now is that they too have a life-changing decision moment out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, in my case, you know, spending two years not knowing what's over the next sand dune, looking at the stars at night and reflecting upon the world that I've left behind – um, I was making a lot of decisions and one of them was I wanted people to experience the changes that were occurring in me, but their own changes, their own style of doing things, you know, mm -hmm. what's important for them in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so as it turned out, one of the stations that we passed along the way heading towards the Royal Children's Hospital uh, was Beltana Station. They said, come back and uh, let's do camel safaris. Oh, wow. And of, course, and, of course, they were talking about, you know, tourism, you know, bums on seats type thing. Yeah. And uh, I got to the end of the expedition, you know, met up with Maura Kelly, and it was at the same time when Trishna and Krishna were being separated. And so... Hang on, just, you just left all these names. Maura Kelly, Trishna and Krishna. What are we talking there? Okay, so Maura Kelly from the Maura Kelly Children's First Foundation. Yep. She is the legal guardian of Trishna and Krishna, the conjoined twins from Bangladesh who were separated a number of years ago. Gotcha. Okay, so that was the foundation that I was actually doing the camel expedition for. Mm-hmm. Okay, and we arrived at the children's hospital while Trishna and Krishna were being separated. Yep. Uh, timing was just phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could, yeah. No one could have ever picked that. Um, and, uh, yeah, very much described in my book, Camel Man Dreaming, that uh, moment. And it was just – it still brings a, a big lump in my throat. Mm. Um, didn't expect it. But um, what, a, what a wonderful um, thing, though. I mean, it, it, nothing's – I don't believe in coincidences. Uh, the fact that you took 13 years was maybe because that moment had to find – it had to arrive and the timing was – was as it was, you know, uh, everything's accurate. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, that's right. And I, I do a speech now um, describing, um, you know, the entire journey and also talking about, you know, making changes within life and uh, for yourself, but also, um, you know, the state of the world and how we can do better. Um, and I believe that actually business is a key to this, um, of changing the world, you know, for for you know, future generations for a better world. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, I very much talk about it. And uh, in India, the camel is the symbol of love. And um, and for Trishna and Krishna, at that particular moment in time, they needed all the love they could get. Mm. And it just seems paradoxical almost that, uh, you know, camels arrived at the hospital when they needed as much love yeah, as what they wow. could possibly get. Synchronicity, hey? It's amazing, yeah. 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 So the decision to actually, um, you know, do a business was sort of a bit of a flippant one in many ways, but it was sort of there. It was always with me um, to basically it was an opportunity for me to spend time with the camels after the expedition. Mm -hmm. And that was really the, the essence of actually setting up the safari business. I didn't. I wasn't all that interested in, you know, bums on seats tourism type thing. I'd been involved in mainstream tourism, mm. and uh, to me, it didn't. It lacked some substance that 
was my driving force, if you like. And then as people came out and we got the feedback afterwards um, of, you know, people emailed me um, after they'd been on safari and were saying, I've changed my life. Uh, I'm now on a five-year plan. I'm thinking of one woman in particular from New Zealand, and uh, she was a corporate lawyer. And she said, I went into law to help the world and, you know, make some changes and do good. And she said, all I found out was it was all just about money. And she said, it wasn't who I was, who I am, you know, what I'm about. And so this email came back. She said, I'm on a five-year plan. I am no longer in five years going to be a corporate lawyer, and I am going to follow a dream because I'm not going to reach my deathbed thinking I wonder what that would have been like. So, all the result of all the result of a camel safari. Yeah, that's right. So this is interesting. This is, we we had a chat you and I before we hit record today and you know this wasn't my intention of getting you on the show wasn't to talk about how you've mastered Facebook or how you you know what an amazing website you've got it was none of that. It was about the marketing that you're doing is about from what I have seen and what you've just said, creating this experience. So you you actually go in, for, you, you don't necessarily go and market your business as a life-changing experience. Correct me if I'm wrong here. You are marketing it as a camel safari, but right. you are absolutely um, styling the product, if you like, um, making the product so that people do actually have these experiences and you kind of know, you've, you would almost look at them knowingly as they enter the first day going, yeah, yeah, you think you're just going for a walk with a camel. Yeah. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> True? Almost. Well, I mean, the fact that people are, um, are interested in doing something different like a camel safari, even if it's a mainstream type ride, um, a, a safari ride, um, is interesting in itself because it's obvious that they're looking for something different other than going to Cooter Beach or something like that. Yep. Right. So that so that you know that they're they're of a different nature type of person anyway. They're open to an experience. They're open to an experience, and they're wanting something new and different mm. anyway. Mm. So really, I'm actually just allowing it to flow within themselves. The camels and the reaction and the connection that they get with the camels is brilliant um, because I show them over the week how to connect with the camel and uh, it's a spiritual connection. It's, you know, so much more than just simply his, his big doofy animal. animal. <laughs> um, and also they're connecting once again with the land because we don't ride the camels. The camels are purely pack camels, allowing us to go to places where four-wheel drives just can't go. Right. And by doing that also, we don't take the same route twice. We never take the same route twice because I'm exploring that country as well. Mm -hmm. So we're finding Aboriginal occupation sites uh, we're finding, you know, some of the early settler stuff. We're finding even evidence of the early explorers that pass through that way. Mm -hmm. And so there's over the week they're getting a connection as well. But just being able to reflect on their lives, they've basically left everything behind for a week. They've, they've, you, the desert doesn't lie and you can't hide from yourself. And so... Yeah, there's, there's almost like a, it's a procedural thing that basically the decisions that they, they're perhaps teetering on or perhaps they're thinking about an area of their life, in which case, you know, could need improvement, etc. it comes naturally. And, and do, you, um, do you just let that happen? I mean, do you, do you actually, or do you facilitate, you know, are there team building things that happen, you know, over the, around the campfire or is it all completely informal? People choose to do what they want to do, but stuff happens. Yeah, stuff happens. <laughs> we don't have to do a great deal at all. I mean, some of our some of our tracks that we're doing are purposeful tracks, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, highlight this um, life changing experiences that uh, they have out there, um, such as yoga journeys, for example. Uh, we're taking artists uh, groups out there. We're taking photography groups out there. A friend of mine, uh, Afroz, is a, a an imam in Sydney. And he brought out some city um, youth, Muslim youth, mm -hmm. and they too had that life-changing experience out there because they're not only reconnecting with the land and reconnecting with uh, animals but also reconnecting with each other and themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's society too, uh, that's um, 
yeah, it's so fast paced. Uh, a lot of people, uh, the interaction is not on a personal nature anymore. I mean, it's via you know, hotmail, email, Skype, you know, whatever. Um, and so there's not that connection anymore with uh, the land, people, etc. You know, where we actually fit in the world. Mm. And um, and I think that's part of the success of um, Outback Australian Camels is that, um, yeah, people do reconnect again and in that process are making decisions for their own lives and usually for the better. Russ, this question might go nowhere, but I've got a feeling it, I, I, need, I feel like I need to ask it. Like you have a business, it's camels, you're tracking, you're creating an environment where just stuff, amazing emotional stuff's going to happen. And I talk a lot on this show about branding and the fact that brand, you know, to create a brand, you need to create an emotional connection between yep. you and your customers, your clients. Yep. You, you kind of, you have a business that does that. I, I just yep. want to see whether you and I can translate those learnings from your business into someone who's got a plumbing business or a gym or is a dentist uh, right. or, or is just, you know, selling widgets, you know? Right. Yep, yep. Is yep. there anything anything come to mind when I kind of raise that? Yeah, totally. We don't have clients. We don't have participants. We, you know, In our business, we don't have that. And initially, the first contact, if someone's gone through the website, maybe seen you know, the new movie that's been put out of Robert Davidson's tracks, mm-hmm. and thought, oh, this would be nice, a nice holiday, and they initially contact us, basically that's a connection that's being made. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they you know, decide, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that, and they come out with us, what develops is not just simply a client... Um, a business and a client relationship, but what actually develops is a friendship. Yeah, right. And I think that when you go ahead and build on friendships, um, then, you know, like you might not know whether your dentist is the best dentist in the in the district, but because you like him and he likes you and you have great conversations mm. or you have a great connection, that you keep returning back to that dentist. Mm-hmm. So, um, so so your point is about you know looking at the people who do hand money over to you in a different light and and maybe the idea you're suggesting friends i i've heard the idea i've heard a saying before you know i don't do business with friends but people who i do business with often become friends yes yeah and also the handing over of money i mean money basically is just a form of exchange um you know, with some of our, uh, our friends, for want of a better word now, um, who come out with us, we actually do other exchanges too, which um, does not involve money. Um, they contract. might have a product which we require, and and so, you know, we're doing a, a good exchange, if you like, on a bartering system as mm-hmm. well. Uh, you know, it all depends. I mean, but money is just... I don't look at money as just simply a bunch of numbers or anything. It's just a method of exchange of which case we've imaginarily gone ahead and place value upon mm. and um and you know we can go ahead and uh, exchange you know goods and services with this stuff so what's the scoreboard for um for outback australian camels when when, when you reflect with your wife going okay well, how, how do you reckon things are going i mean many businesses would look at the bank balance some yep. would look at the profit and loss the yep. balance sheet what, what are you what's your scoreboard Okay, our scoreboard, basically, it, it's not money, although that's that's there. The balance sheet's there, uh, and that can be reflected upon, and we can look at that. That's fine. What actually our, our, our aim is, is how many people can we serve? How many people can we make happy? How many friends can we develop? How many groups can we go ahead and service for their particular purpose? Um, you know, what value... Can we offer um, to be able to be of use to society? Mm-hmm. Uh, the more people that we help, uh, not only are the more people making life-changing decisions and you know, sort of having a great time at the same time, and being out in the bush, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right, with an experience that they'll never forget, blah blah blah. But also, the money just flows. Mm-hmm. So it's not the focus isn't on the money because we don't think that if you we think that if you actually focus just on the money, you're not focusing on your product, you're not focusing on what value the people are actually getting and why they'd want to come out with you in the first place. Mm. 
I've I've heard this so many times. It's I absolutely believe it. I remember I interviewed Jeff Harris, the owner of Flight Center, Brian Singer, the owner of Rip Curl, uh, right through to smaller players who have been on this show. And honestly, they all say this. And it's a a massive leap of faith to the small business owner listening who is looking at the scoreboard as being the bank account uh, yeah. to say, you know what. I'm not going to look at the bank account for the next six months and yeah. I am just going to create something amazing, something that, you know, I know that people want and need. Absolutely, absolutely. And what we also recognise using that philosophy is that there is no end to the marketplace. Hmm. It's an interesting coming from a bloke who, you know, you're offering a, a, the opportunity to walk with a camel into the desert. But what you're just telling me now is that the marketplace, the marketplace is, is, is not small, it's endless. Yes, hmm. exactly. So I explain that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, look. if we were the run-of-the-mill, you know, mainstream tourism business, hmm. um, there's only, um, okay, at certain times when you have your peaks and your, your troughs, right? Hmm. Um and also there's only a certain number of people then who would want to go and uh, do a camel safari uh, during their holidays, okay? Um, that number would fluctuate and increase. It depends on, you know, sort of how you market and whether or not you create the need for people to go ahead and um, uh, want to do that type of experience. But what we're doing is we're saying, okay, you're wanting an experience or you're needing something in life. Everyone's got needs, mm -hmm. absolutely everyone. And perhaps the need is within yourself. So why don't you come out and reflect upon yourself, you know, make a connection with yourself, back with the land, back with animals, back with uh, you know, other people as well, and find out what it is that you know can satisfy that need through you or your group. Mm -hmm. And so by actually enticing groups who are already established um, we're all part of groups in society anyway, but, uh, uh, you know, enticing groups or encouraging groups, okay, this is a great opportunity for the corporate world, for example, and, you know, for, for a corporate organisation to come out and do some team building for a particular purpose. You design your program, but you're going to find that the connections between people will become a lot stronger. Mm. So we'll actually go ahead and increase your business sales because people will actually realise that, okay, it's the value that they're offering their corporation and their clients that, um, you know, it makes a big difference. Yeah. So, yeah, the market is endless. I love it. Well, it's a good way to, you know, it's it's uh, that certainly opens up more opportunities. So any business that kind of can take that attitude and, and not be caught up in just, you know, a small target market, uh, that, that's a great thing to uh, advise them, Russ. Hey, mate, um, love this chat. I reckon there'll be a few listeners here who are just getting a little bit itchier to go and chase down that dream. I, I would encourage them. I know you would, Russ. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, life's just too worthwhile living and, uh, you, you know, yeah, just don't reach the deathbed before you, you know, before you even know it and uh, think, well, either, gee, I wish I had had the guts to go ahead and um, start up my business. You know, sure, it's going to be difficult, but it's possible, um, number one. But mm. uh, secondly, you know, if you're already in business, you know, just get to your market and realise that it's endless. And, and Russ, um, before I share my last crackingly good camel joke, uh, and I've given you plenty of time to come up with one yourself, um, just just want to go back and uh, because there will be listeners who are suffering, who are in a dark place, who are suffering from depression, or just just you know, as I frame it, in the shitter. Um, what do you say to them? You've suggested make a decision. That's easier said than done. If you're really feeling down and out, is there any any bit of advice that you can you can leave them with? Yeah, um, for sure. Look, you're there for a reason, um, and that reason's probably to learn something. And uh, it's going to pass. Everything does. And you're only preparing yourself for brighter days ahead anyway. So, you know, just basically as Winston Churchill said, never give up. Mm. And, um, and, you know, your, your time will come when you have to depart anyway. Mm. Uh, uh, that comes to us all. That's all there is to it. Don't make it sooner 
than what it you know, is planned for. Well, uh, w- w- Winston Churchill suffered from depression, and he is a wonderful quote, and I don't remember it specifically, but it was about animals, and he said he loved pigs, and he, he said, you know, cats, cats think they're better than us, dogs, yeah. um, dogs look up to us, but pigs think they're one of us. Yeah, <laughs> S- something like that, anyway. So he'd go. I, I think he was known to go. He had a pig out the back of Downing Street there, and would go and spend a little bit of time with <laughs> with it every now and then. Hey, uh, what, what do you call a crying camel? Oh, that one I don't know. Humpback whale. <laughs> hey, you know your joke, your camel jokes, and some I've never heard before. I've heard of just about all the others that you couldn't repeat on radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. This is podcasting, so I have complete creative control. That's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Russ, I've enjoyed this, mate. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the small business big marketing movement. And uh, uh, I know there's going to be some great discussion uh, on the show notes. So uh, look out for that. Uh, thanks for being a part of it, mate. It's an absolute pleasure, Tim. And um, yeah, good luck. Uh well, not even good luck. I don't think there's such a thing. You know, careful planning, etc., and designing things. You know, just go for it. It's worth it. We'll leave it there. Thanks, Russ. Righto. Thanks, mate. In my chat with Russell Osborne, he spoke about overcoming depression. If you or someone close to you suffers from a mental illness such as depression or anxiety, then remember Lifeline is a 24-hour confidential and anonymous service you can call from anywhere within Australia on 13 11 14. That's 13 11 14. Wow, what an interview. Uh, I promised uh, some in-depth discussion, and that is exactly what we got. I hope there was something in there for you guys, and um, I'm about to share my top three learnings from that. But first, before I do, I want to let you in on a little secret that smart business owners everywhere are on to. Have you got marketing materials lying around that need a little tweaking? Maybe the details on your business card need a little updating or your logo needs altering? Or you'd like to change the colour of that beige shirt you accidentally wore in your profile shot? No worries at all. That'll be $19, thank you, and it'll be done in an hour, thanks to Swiftly.com. Small design fixes fast. That is how Swiftly.com roll. You simply upload the artwork that needs fixing, tell them what needs doing, and boom, one hour later and 19 bucks later, it's done. Check them out, Swiftly.com. That's S-W-I-F-T-L-Y. So the Russell Osborne fireside chat. I got a lot out of that. I'm going to give him a top three. Number one, face your fears and do it anyway. I think that's the name of a book. But I know all of us business owners, we've got fears coming out our proverbials, some more than others, and they are stopping us from cranking out something great. So even that idea of taking your eye off the financial scoreboard for six months and just going ahead and creating something amazing could be a little strategy you may want to consider implementing. Number two, keep the final destination front of mind always. I love that. You know, Russ talking about being in Kings Canyon or wherever he was with the camels, but having his eye on the prize of walking into Melbourne with eight camels in tow and um, don't even go there. But keep the final destination front of mind always. Number three, learning from that fireside chat, when you're stuck or feeling low, make a decision. Just make a decision. It might not be the right decision, but you can always alter it later on. The idea here is to continue to move forward, team. And uh, I know that there are people out there who are doing it tough. Uh, So make a decision, move forward. That way you can develop some momentum. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Russell as much as I did. That almost wraps up the show. But I do have some listener reviews read by El Presidente Numero Uno, President Obama. And I want to say a very, very big thank you to the great folk at Net Registry for bringing this show to us all. Without them, we could not exist. They make this show happen, as well as our friends at Swiftly.com. Team, don't forget to join the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. I'm in there every day answering your marketing questions and challenges. Love to see you inside the inner circle. Until next week, may your marketing be the best marketing 
See you later. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Hello, this is Barack, your Commander-in-Chief. Well done, Timbo, on a great show. Myself and others love the marketing goal you share each week. Here's what some of my constituents have to say. Hello, Timbo. Peter here from Distant Hills Guest House in the Highland of Scotland. Just listened to episode 173 and must thank you for the inspiration. I signed up for the Springwise newsletter, and when you started talking about following up leads, it prompted me to do so. I followed up on an inquiry from January for a stay at our guest house, and because of the follow-up, I secured a 522-pound booking. How's that? As you say in Australia, I believe. Thanks again for all the episodes. Peter. Hey, Timbo. I love your show. Just started listening a year ago. I'm spending more time on my website, including fresh content via blog posts, etc. This will be my main marketing strategy. Fresh content from the blogs, as well as AdWords campaigns, and more touching base with my existing clients. Your podcast makes me feel that I can really take charge of my marketing for my business, instead of me thinking that it's too expensive, or I'd have to contract the marketing out to an expert. Thanks again, mate. And as soon as I can afford it, I'll join your forum. Kel from Matech. Hi, Timbo. I simply wanted to say thank you for a couple of things. Number one, all your work. It's really great having a place I can go to for fresh ideas and awesome interviews. Number two, your enthusiasm. I work from home, and apart from my dog, Henry, it can be a bit dull, especially the Christmas parties. So thanks for putting in so much energy. Steve from adam.com.au Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com